There are episodes where there are a lot of questions. And then there are those episodes where you just listen. On this episode of the X and Y Convos, that is titled, Rape is the Elephant in the Room, I listened to Dorothy Njemanze, renowned SGBV advocate who has continued to champion awareness and advocacy about the scourge of rape and sexual and gender-based violence in our society. With Dorothy, we explore the barriers that hinder open discussion of sexual assault and rape in our society. We address questions of why rape is considered a gendered issue, the taboo nature of rape and its impact on laws and policies aimed at reducing rape, and cultural and religious factors that enable rapists and protect them from consequences. It's not all gloom and doom as we talk about what is possible and how we can make a society that is safe for all. Come, let's listen. So I'm so excited that I get to have this conversation with you because, frankly, I think you are the poster child for advocacy about sexual and gender-based violence and rape awareness, rape prevention in Nigeria. So thank you for taking the time to have this conversation. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in. Why is rape still the elephant in the room? Despite everybody knows it happens, we know why it happens, but somehow we still don't want to talk about it. Well, because um, females have been made to feel ashamed of their bodies and the right to access to justice for females has been made to look like um, any female who is seeking justice mm. is a wicked person because um, patriarchal, so, patriarchal normative practices have made many females to be socialized into the ideology that they are supposed to be gentle, forgiving, no mm. matter what happens to them, mm. at rape being, you yeah, know, one that. of those things. Mm. Um, uh, not just rape, every other type. So even attempted rape is as grievous as rape mm. in itself. Right. So if people are shamed for recognizing that they belong to a particular gender, it's right. a problem. Then if people are further shamed for expectation, gender roles attributed mm. to said gender, that's a problem. Then where law enforcement and other state mechanisms fail right. people who are in danger of mm. exposure to such a problem right. or who actually are exposed to such problems, mm. then there's further um, problems. Yes. And what it's culminating to is it, uh, it, it enables a culture of enabling rapists and rape right. culture. And so the normal thing to do would be that as much as possible, uh, shame will continually be deployed hmm. to ensure that less people apply hmm. the justice routes. Wow. So shame itself is it has become weaponized. Absolutely. Uh, to perpetuate the In culture different of silence. Ways, re right. With religious uh, uh, tones, with traditional tones. Right. Um, are you the perfect victim? Mm. What were you wearing? Mm. How did you look? Uh, you did you shout? <laughs> if you didn't shout, maybe right. you're doing mm -mm, and people think that mm -mm is enjoying it. Yes, enjoying it. Mm. You know, forgetting that mm -mm can also be pain. Right. So I, I, before we go forward, because I know that the very next question in a lot of people's minds is, "Oh, but boys get raped too." Absolutely. And I'm just, and I know there's been a lot of conversation around. I find it odd that people feel the need to say, "Oh, what about boys?" When the conversation is about maybe the gendered nature of rape. But in reality, we do have cases of uh, boys and men being raped as Absolutely. well. And I'm just wondering. Um, does this this constraint, does it also, is it general in terms of the culture of shame or silence around rape that happens with men and boys? Okay, you know, the thing is when you, when you make something culture mm. with the people who suffer in majority, then it makes it worse off for those who suffer in minority. minority. Right. Um, because of normative practices... Females are more susceptible to rape. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's a wide range of scenarios that's coming to my head ready, readily. Right. But where 
these numbers are constantly pushed away and the right responses are not you know set in place right. or support systems are not set in place for these the next thing would be when the other few uh, you, you know the other group of people who don't fit into the who don't check all the boxes right. of being female mm -hmm. you know become raped or have sexual exploitations or abuses in any way what then is the structure for them right we keep advocating for gender and equal opportunities bill. And I say one of the reasons that is important is because when we're thinking about response to rape and sexual and gender-based violence, mm -hmm. we're thinking about how to provide services for females. We're mm -hmm. supposed to be thinking about how to provide holistic services. Right. Because while we're talking about the males and females, what of the intersex people mm -hmm. that get raped? Mm -hmm. They also need services. So right. we should provide services. We should tailor our services our responses and our issues to suit human beings and not gender. Right, right. That way, even the um, conversations around denying females from accessing justice will be squashed. Right, because then it's not females. It's, hey, it's we're human. providing this for... Absolutely. It's a human service. Yes. Okay, so I know that the VAP Act exists and we know the stipulations around rape, even though spousal rape is not covered in the VAP Act at the moment. Explicitly. Explicitly covered. Um but so there are the laws, but then there is the actual administration, implementation. actual implementation of these laws. And I'm just wondering if there's a correlation. It, it should be odd that the courts are afraid to make pronouncements and judgments that the justice system from, mm. from, from arrest all the way to persecution. But it looks like that's what persists, that this culture of silence, the taboo nature of rape persists even in access to justice. Well, before you get to what happens in the courts, remember that the courts only work with whatever the investigation process, right. you know, serves the courts. Yeah. Um, it's flawed, generally. Mm -hmm. Currently, my organization is looking into a case that um, it's an eight-year-old that was raped, right? Hmm. Child's Rights Act was said to have been uh, violated mm. in the course of investigation. However... The same police institution went to court and is prosecuting with penal code in 2023. So I think that there are so many oh people boy. along the line. We have a lot of corruption reading systems that are deliberate about providing soft landing to perpetrators because mm. perpetrators are willing to pay a lot of things. And that speaks to the independence of the police system, you know. Uh, the police reforms. If people do not need to pay for files again and all that, mm. and the burden of all the expenses, because access to justice is, you know, unfairly expensive. expensive. Right. Now, we've spoken about the investigation. Then when you get to the courts, who is appearing in court? The police prosecutor appearing in court is the person aware of the provisions of mm. the, the law, mm. Because so many people will tell you, well, before I got to law school or in law school, it's penal code that was there, all these new, new laws. We hear a lot of that. And then a lot of, <laughs> yeah. I've also heard the arguments of somebody that said, well, what if the judge does not appreciate the new law? So we've heard all sorts of okay. things. Wow. I, I hear all sorts of these things and it's crazy. And then again, there's that aspect of, um, if it is, a family member that is the perpetrator. Right. We have state institutions constantly insisting that their work is not to scatter families. And to that oh. effect, they advise um, uh, people who need justice to, to seek, no, to look for how they can pay for private services. So when Singal Sinachi died and people said, live to live, live to live, I kept asking, live to where? What are the state? Institution Thank you. instituted um, responses. There's a lot of irresponsibility. I admit very largely there is a lot of progress that has been made, but, but in comparison to what is needed, ah, the irresponsibility is shouting. High. Right. Many people who are in court for rape cases do not know the names of their prosecutor, the state prosecutor. Uh oh. The state prosecutors still make it. A point of duty. So state prosecutors don't turn up in court many times where um, uh, survivors right. are unable to pay their transportation costs. And state now, prosecutors. Absolutely. Oh, Quote me. Boy. 
And now, with the increase in fuel prices, it is now an average of 10,000 naira that people are looking to For mistake. victims who are already... I'm talking about only the state prosecutor. I haven't spoken about if the IPOs that, you know, were part of the investigations need to make it to the court. So, it is more and more... Incre it's, 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 it's increasingly a problem accessing justice. Right. When you want to access legal service, uh, legal aid... Uh, services, it still falls within the um, state's supported systems. Right. And you keep on hearing, well, we would rather broker peace or I would, I would say enforce mediation or force mediation. mediation. You don't force mediation. Mediation can only happen where the parties are willing. And when people have been sexually violated, you cannot be forcing mediation. So, sorry, just <laughs> so, because some, something sounds Absolutely absurd. Yeah. Rape Welcome to my world. is a criminal offense. Uh, in the books, rape of children, we're supposed to understand, we're all supposed to act in the best interest of children. Last year, a rape of a three-year-old was reported. We reported this, uh, she had uh, evidence of a tear in the vagina and in the anus, right? Oh, but God. till today that I'm talking to you, nothing has been done. Absolutely nothing. Guess what? The parents cannot afford the things. In fact, the parents have other crimes that were we reported to law enforcement against the parents. Mm. And the child is still in custody of those people. There's oh a limit God. to what we can do. The, you know? I'm sorry. So forgive me for stopping you. The three year old yes. is still with the parents. Her father is the alleged perpetrator. Oh God. Good. So we have irresponsible systems, and I say it with every sense of humility and honesty, until we start having people who are responsible enough to recognize that everybody is an emotional being with human rights, and trauma not properly handled can harm the society, society at large, absolutely. you know, then things will not change. The tokenist um, offerings right. towards uh, survivors of sexual violence yes. in general you know, are totally unacceptable. Um, at best, something has happened to somebody and you say, okay, we gave the woman 50,000 naira, we gave her 20,000 naira. The eight-year-old I spoke oh. about has sought, because she was raped by a cultist, somebody who identifies as a cultist. Now, she's the first child. She has two younger ones. The three of them are out of school, have been out of school for sessions. We have appealed to the government to support with their education until now right. it's yielded no fruit. So their, uh, uh, their alternative to access to education would be if we find money to she, put them back in right. school. For people like my organization, the Dorothy Jamaze Foundation, you know, the Survivor Support Center, right. it's been very, 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 very difficult. It's not been easy to achieve, you know. So we're constantly begging. There's a lot of indignity in accessing right. resources to support survivors. And that's totally unacceptable. <laughs> so it seems more and more like we're living through a, a, a myriad of impossibilities. Right. You know? And that would explain also why on our, so, uh, on our suicide watch list, we have more minors. Majority minors. of the people are minors. State is failing. The state has been grossly irresponsible. Right. Let's call it what it is. What it is. You know, that you have made a few steps does not mean you have yes, fit the holistic picture. The budget lines are still faulty. Right. We need to fix the budget lines. Mm. What's the exit strategy for those who are in the shelters or those who need right. shelter? Where can survivors get their first rent from? All the numerous schemes that the government claims it has for, you know, the poor of the yeah. poorest and the survivors of mm. different kinds of trauma. You know, the humanitarian ministries, the CBNs, yeah. Ministry of War, yeah, where are the housing people. schemes? Yeah. Can all, all the banks now proclaim that they have one thing or the yeah. other in place for women? Survivors of sexual violence, can they afford this? Can Many they times they right? run with only their lives. They leave their certificates Absolutely. behind. Should that stop them from accessing, accessing the means of livelihood? Right. You know, and then if you now think about those of us that render support services to them, we're constantly, you know, harmed. There's hostility from perpetrators. There's hostility from survivors whose cases mm. you're unable to take on. Right. There's hostility from law enforcement and other, you know, corruption-ridden systemic 
practices. And then we are constantly exposed to diseases, amongst other things. You know, we're always using our resources. We're always begging for the most mundane of things and the most severe of things. There should be some degree of responsibility. The National Health yeah. um, Act, Act, right? Yeah. When we talk about emergency services, it's sexual true. and gender-based violence is an emergency service. It is. So why is it not on the list of things that should be treated for free in all general hospitals, hospitals. and primary healthcare facilities? You know, post-exposure prophylaxis, access to it seems to be increasingly expensive. Right. And these are the different stages of irresponsibility. That you know, <laughs> relates to encouraging the yeah. perpetration of this because it looks like, but you, you, you will get tired. We still hear uh, people in uh, law enforcement offices tell yeah. survivors, "Can you afford a lawyer? Can you afford a lawyer?" Wow. Excuse me, what is the provision of the state? Protection of life and property. Yes. When I am sexually violated, my life that's, should that's, be defended. Yes. If I am violated and I suffer tears and you know, fractures and the rest. The yeah. state should be able to support me to access justice. The sexual assault referral centers, fantastic innovation, but there are some tests and scans that they, that they do not offer. To, yeah. I ask again, who then would offer them? If a two-year-old is raped, the cost of access to justice for the two-year-old is very expensive. Then you can now imagine what will happen to me and you when, when we go through those. If stuff. we go through those kind of things. Yeah. So, until responsibility you know comes to play and what will bring this responsibility to play recognition of the fact that the people who are victims mm -hmm. and survivors mm -hmm. or potential you know uh supports or care caregivers to survivors you know of rape are human beings they're emotional beings with human rights and then the governor uh, the government takes action to defend that, you know, we're going to be reading you know, around the same thing. What's the composition of the people who make our who policies? Who make our laws? Who make the policies? Majority are men. Yes. Majority of them are not, are not just men. They are men who believe in the perpetration of the violence that we against speak women. against. Mm. So we need increased voices on the table. It doesn't mean that increased females on the table means increased knowledge, knowledge you know? yeah. but irrespective of the gender that is on the table we need to hold everybody accountable, accountable. for protecting the lives of all the emotional beings with human rights that are dependent on them. absolutely i mean we've we've gone to school we've 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 needed therapy just in the five minutes and i just wonder what that is <laughs> like for you i mean this is just us listening to all these different I encounters <laughs> You know, I was going to ask the question about, you know, social infrastructure. I have always been a firm believer that don't tell women to leave. So where? Just like you said, go where? So before we, before, you know, again, social media, forgive me, I, I don't think social media has done us a lot of good. It has. In, <laughs> in terms of, uh, because that language, that framing of... Okay, in terms of, in the, terms language, of the narrative... Right, but for the, the fact framing, that we have been able to support speak, people right. via social media. Yeah. We wow. Are, yes, we beg a lot, and then people on social media, you know, make Check it, it up. a point of duty to periodically support us, you know, or looking, or once in a while, one-off support for wow. different people, and that's how it's been. You know, I, you know, I'm always questioning uh, because there's a lot of fiscal transparency and accountability work looking into budgets. And I'm always curious about the budget that the Ministry of Women Affairs has and what is contained in that and whether or not all these gender issues that we talk about, whether or not that is even factored into the design of their budgets. Well, that's the that's the ministry that ends the list. Let's start from Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And then <laughs> what would have been their cash cow, so to say, being the social development aspect of the ministry has right. been taken away from them and given to the Ministry Human of Humanitarian. So they seem to be stuck with policy, you hmm. know, yes, policy advocacy. Right. Pretty much. That's what Without, they can do. They can't really the bulk take of the much work action. with the advocacy that hmm. they do. We'll stop with uh, uh, Ministry of Justice, for instance. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm aware that the gender policy, the national gender policy, yeah. you know, there's a, there's an appeal on the court judgments that the Nigerian women celebrated last year. And who is leading it? Uh, Federal Ministry of Justice. So, exactly. 
Irresponsibility. That's irresponsibility. That. Just, irresponsibility. Nobody just seems to be able to connect the dots from the harm to society from these things that are far from you because I mean that's that that's is far, that seems far from you because it hasn't happened to you, hasn't happened to your wife or your daughter or or it hasn't happened to your husband or something. And the direct linkage to harm in society. Well, I remember that Nigeria is the first country that a law court pronounced guilty of gender-based violence in the Dorothy Germanzi and three others versus the Federal Republic of Nigeria case at the yeah. Ecowas Court. Yeah. This was in 2017 that the judgment came. We're in 2023. The damages awarded to us have not been paid. paid. So the body language, as far as women are concerned, has been abysmal, has shown irresponsibility. Mm. If the body language of the, you know, the government speaks irresponsibility, then the state's actors that work on behalf of the government, that I mean, represent the government... They have a free pass. I mean, they have a free pass. Mm. How, how do you want to hold accountable somebody... For when you have not proven accountability, you know, your own actions, exactly so. for your own actions, and so that's that's the reality we live in. Okay, it's a it's a mess. <laughs> it is, and the biggest failure of society right. would be that we keep sitting down and waiting for the government. Who is the government? Government for the people, of the people, by the people, right? Mm -hmm. The people feature the most in the definition of the, the government. government. Yes. So, alternative resources. Right or alternative funding patterns to support survivors of rape. Mm. If the people can raise that, then the people will be saving more of the people, Most knowing people, that we don't know right. which, of, which members of the people will be victims, will be victims of the of system. Right. So corporate social responsibility needs to focus a lot on I mean, survival. for as long as we have that gap in government then there has to, we can't just all fold our hands and say, well, what, what are we to do now? It's, it's one tier of government. That's the, that's the, uh, the leadership aspect of the right. government. But even that, the highest office in the Federal Republic of Nigeria, to the best of my knowledge, is the office of the citizen. The docility of the citizen over a long period of time has encouraged a lot of um, unfair practices Absolutely. by people who we have entrusted. But, but can we link offices. that to, again, just... Uh, for, and I, I, I know I keep bringing this up because... We, we did see, we have seen increasingly citizens get more involved. In, Absolutely. But when it comes to issues of gender-based violence and all of that, we don't seem to be able to carry our angst and anger from uh, social uh, channels and social to and tying that. For instance, and this, for me, the election period was um, a little sad for me because I saw a lot of women who were advocates of, you know, gender equality and pushing keep absolutely mum about the thorough lack of representation across all political parties. Well, the, I hope now that we have started our advocacy to ensure that there's not a repetition of a lot of things. Yeah. A lot of the advocacies we started when it came to um, what the issue that you have just raised, yes. they came late. Mm. They came towards the primaries. Right. A lot of lobbying is done At way ahead. Right. You understand? And so when we increase the number of people that make it through the primaries, then it that makes became, a lot of sense. Yeah. Now, uh, we're expecting ministerial lists. Okay. While we're expecting the ministerial list, we need to be putting pressure to say nothing short of 35% representation, is yeah. okay. Whether from the president or from a governor, yeah. it's not okay. If there's any board appointment that you know, does not meet 35%, Represent by all means, strategic litigation immediately because it falls below expectation. So the citizens' docility is encouraging a lot of bad behavior. Phew. And the citizens' docility, all, there are so many women who had issues. You know, we've tried to do a post-mortem of the issues right. that women had. And a lot of it stemmed from the fact that they, they found help late when, it didn't, mm. when, when not much could, could be, be done. done. Yeah. So there's a lot to do. Okay. Uh, we're, we're wrapping this up now, and I just want to... Are there examples across the world in clients that we can borrow from, both that links both citizen action, corporate social responsibility with government actions, or even something that looks... Because I know across the world, it's still quite a struggle. Uh, but is there an example that we can say, hey, this worked here. Perhaps we can borrow some ideas from here, from here, from here. To there, make us begin to... There are so many examples. If mm. we're going into the examples, that would be another show. 
But yeah. for now, the word that excites me the most, right. which is making me to, you know, amplify uh, advocacy on active bystanding, right. is, you know, the Green Dots campaign in the United States of America, where just for signifying that your facility is Green Dots compliant, that is what is recommended by females, you know, as the go-to place. Wow. So I think that we should do that. That's interesting. Yes, maybe then the people who are uh, profiteering from the corruption would not want to sign on and more, they would have less patronage. Right. You know, there are certain practical things we can do. But yeah. at the end of the day, it stems down to us being firm about taking a Action. stand on, you know, having action. Thank you so very much. I feel like we should keep talking for like, I feel like we should just turn the microphone to you and just hear you talk about, you know, all the work that you've well, done. Well, I invited you for a tour, so let's do the tour. And then Absolutely. We'll yeah, I would love to do that. Fantastic. I would love to do that with you. Thank you so very much for Thank taking for the time. Me. And I mean, I hope you were not just listening like, oh, another talk about, you know, rape and all of that. I hope you were learning, you could be listening next. to... <laughs> That's the reality. You could be next. That's the reality. Your your daughter may be next. Your mother may be next. Yes. You know, you that's, may be next as a man. Yeah. So yeah. that's the reality. And we hope that you're taking action and that um, you become one of those citizens who is an active bystander. Absolutely. Who is speaking out and saying, we stand for this and we support this. Again, Dorothy, thank you. Thank you for much. having me. Thank you.